And we're in our sermon series in 1 Corinthians, and we're looking at uh, probably what's the most well-known passage in all of 1 Corinthians, uh, the love passage. Uh, Listen now to God's word to you and to me from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes... What is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, so, you know, it's, uh, before we get into the specifics of the text, I want us to, I want to remind you of what we're doing right now, why we worship and why God gives us the Bible and why we preach and why the sermon and the preaching and the hearing of God's word is so important. So so what I want you to know is that whenever God gives us his word, his truth, whenever God reveals himself to us, that revelation is never for more information. God doesn't give us God-honoring truth just to give us more information. It's not for information. Because if that's all it is, is more information, all that happens after today's worship service and after you and I study this text together is you go away as more informed, smarter sinners. Nothing's changed. Anytime God gives us his truth, it's always for transformation. Because the purpose of God's revelation is always for making us more like Christ, making us into the image of Christ. So if you and I are not in the business right now of saying, okay, God, meet us where we are with your truth and your word and change us, change us by this text, change us by this truth and revelation, then what we're doing is a total waste of time. God doesn't give us information for information's sake. It's always for transformation. Now, having said that, even if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, you have heard this text before. Uh, This is one of the most well-known passages. It's the love passage. If you've been to any Christian weddings, you've heard this passage. It's read in almost every single wedding. It, and it is a magnificent piece of poetry. And it is a magnificent uh, prose or poetry on love. And 
That's kind of the problem with well-known passages like this that are read out of context. Uh, remember, this text is, comes to us in the middle of a correspondence. 1 Corinthians was a letter, right? Paul and the church in Corinth are talking to one another, writing to one another, and they've been writing, and Paul, uh, this happens in the middle of a correspondence. And so in the, in the middle of this correspondence, if, if this chapter or this section of Paul's letter did not address a particular issue that the Corinthian church was dealing with, wasn't answering some questions that the ch church in Corinth was dealing with, and didn't address the issues that Paul and the church in Corinth were dealing with, then it makes no sense. We read it as if, as if Paul wrote us a marriage sermon, you know, uh, for the 21st century, we, he knew we, he wanted uh, that we would want a poetry, a magnificent poetry on love. And so in the middle of talking about economic inequity, power issues, in the middle of talking about sexual immorality, the abuses of spiritual gifts, the abuse of the Lord's Supper, all of a sudden he's like, hey, let's talk about love. Uh, unless this addresses and meets some needs in the first century church, this is nonsense. So one of the things, anytime you study scripture, before you ever ask the question, what does this text mean for me? You always have to ask, what did this text mean for the church in Corinth? That's who it was written to. So what did it mean for the church in Corinth? What was Paul trying to say? What's love got to do with anything? Well, what is love? Well, this chapter uh, has three sections. Verses 1 to 3 tell us that without love, nothing else that the church does matters. And then verses 4 through 8 defines love, describes love. And then verses 8 through 13 tell us that love is eternal. So let's take a look at these three areas. Verses 1 through 3. And this is pretty astonishing. Look, listen to what Paul says. Even if I speak in tongues... And that was one of the major spiritual gifts uh, that they were arguing about in the early church. They were saying, I speak in tongues, so I'm a way better Christian than you who can't speak in tongues. And, and so even if I speak in tongues of men or uh, even of angels, even if I can speak heavenly talk, even if I have the gift of prophecy, Paul says, even if I can tell you, thus saith the Lord, and I know what the Lord says. Even if I can fathom all the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Imagine that. Even if I had the full knowledge of the kingdom of God. Even if I gave everything I own to the poor. And then this next section is, uh, it's really tame in, in the NIV. It says, even if I give over my body to hardship. But in the Greek, the word there is immolation. Even if I burn my body, set my body on fire to show how much I love Christ, right? What a crazy thought. Even if I do all that, and if I don't have love, it means nothing. And in fact, the formula is whatever the church does, everything minus this thing called love equals nothing. So the church can be awesome at prophesying and about telling us what God wants. And church can be awesome in giving away everything to the poor and all kinds of stuff. If you're missing this love thing, it means absolutely nothing. 
And so then Paul in verses 4 through 8 defines love. And what you need to know about this uh, verses 4 through 8, every time you see the word love, the word there, as you know in the Greek, there were four words, at least four words that we translate as love. And the word, every time you see love in chapter 13, it's agape. It's unconditional love. Unconditional love. And in fact, the, uh, the best way to understand what love is and to uh, understand the meaning of love, just, just take love out of there and replace it with Jesus. Listen to this as you replace love with Jesus. You want to know what love is? Listen. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus does not dishonor others. Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Jesus never fails. Isn't that beautiful? You want to know what love is? Look at Jesus. Jesus is love. And in this section, Paul tells us all that love does and then what love doesn't do. What does love do? What does Jesus do? Jesus is patient, kind, keeps no record of wrongs, rejoices with the truth, protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. What doesn't love do? It is not envious. It does not boast. It is not proud. Doesn't dishonor others. Is not self-seeking. Is not easily angered. Does not delight in evil. Love never fails. And he's writing this, remember, to a, in a context where the church, where like a handful of people, less than 10, are the slave owners. And the rest of the church are the slaves, are the indentured slaves. There's major economic disparity. The haves and the have-nots. So much so that even at communion, at the Lord's Supper, the haves show up with their picnic baskets full of food. And they're getting drunk and full. And by the time the workers show up, the slaves show up, there's no food for communion. There's nothing left. And, and the church thinks nothing of it. Of course, that's the way it is. You're slaves. You provide me the food. And in fact, after I've gotten drunk and eaten all this food, you clean this mess up. That's your job. That's the way it was going down in the life of the church. And, and then it was perfectly fine for slave owners to take advantage sexually of their slaves, whether male or female, young or old. They were always available for their masters. That's happening in the church. Incredible power disparity, sexual ethics, and economic disparity. And Paul's saying, look, it doesn't matter what you're teaching in this church. It doesn't matter what you're saying in this church. It doesn't matter even if you gave away all your possessions to the poor. If you don't have love, none of that matters. And then finally, in verses 8 through 13, Paul tells us the supremacy of love, that love is forever, that love lasts. This whole part about how, look, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, What's in part disappears. When I was a child, they talked like a child, thought like a child, but I put away these childish things. Now we see only in reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Paul, what the heck are you talking about? Okay, here's what he's saying. Look, all these spiritual gifts that Paul identifies, speaking in tongues, prophecy, knowledge, speaking the truth, all these things, healing and all these things, all these spiritual gifts, they will pass away. And what he means by that is, look, these spiritual gifts of knowledge, of prophesying, of speaking in tongues, are temporal until Jesus comes. 
until the fullness of Jesus is revealed. Because right now, because the second coming of Jesus hasn't occurred yet, we need someone to teach and prophesy. We need someone to tell us what the Bible says. We need people to uh, prophesy, speak in tongues and knowledge. But when Jesus is here, we don't need prophecy. We don't need someone to say, thus saith the Lord. We can just turn to Jesus because Jesus is right there. Hey, Jesus, what are you saying? Like right now, Tom Teven, he's not wondering what does Jesus look like? What does Jesus sound like? You know why? Tom Teven's in the presence of Jesus. He's right there with Jesus. He doesn't need someone to say, thus saith the Lord. He can just go, hey, Jesus, did you really say that? Because Jesus is right there. He will see in full. He's not immature anymore. He's fully mature in the presence of God. He doesn't need prophecies or speaking in tongues or knowledge. All the truth is right there in the presence of Jesus. The only thing that lasts forever, even in the presence of Jesus, is unconditional love. Love. Love's still there. Love is the value that makes all other gifts God-honoring. This is the most Jesus-like characteristic, love. Everything, no matter what the church does, minus love is nothing. So the question then, how do we practice this thing called love? How, How do we love? And what makes this so confusing is, even in this text, even in this letter, Paul seems to say two different things. And even with Jesus, we see two different things. We know that Jesus was all loving. And, you know, we think because it's unconditional love, we got to be loving and accepting and lovey-dovey with everything. And there are no boundaries, we think. But listen, Jesus was all loving, but when he saw the money changers at the temple, do you remember what he did? He cleared the temple with righteous indignation, throwing over tables, whipping people. Jesus was all loving, but unleashed a torrent of invectives against the hypocrisy of the religious leaders in Matthew chapter 5, where where Jesus sees these hypocrites And he says to them, you brood of vipers, you snakes, how dare you come to be baptized? So, so, and then, you know, we just got done saying, okay, love is Jesus. And, uh, and, and love, it says, love is not jealous or envious. But then in Exodus chapter 20, you know what God says? I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. What the heck? I thought you just said love is not jealous, love is not envious. And here's God saying, I am a jealous God. What do you do with that? And what do you do with Jesus whipping people, calling people snakes, who come to be baptized. What do you do with that? And Paul, this guy who's talking about this unconditional love in chapter 5, remember when he was talking about the person who was sleeping with his father's wife? He says, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. The guy that's having sex with his father's wife, so his stepmom, he's like, hand him over to Satan. What happened to unconditional love? Hello? So how do we understand this entire text? What was Paul saying? Okay. So when it comes to unconditional love, there are two audiences, two subjects. And depending on who it is you're talking to, unconditional love means two different things. So when it comes to unbelievers, 
when it comes to those who haven't yet received Jesus, unconditional love, agape love, unconditional means literally there are no conditions. You, unconditional, all sinners are welcome to grace. And in fact, the way Brad and I express it a lot in the life of the church is God loves you just the way you are, right? You don't have to be anything other than you in order to receive grace. So, so if you're a heretic right now, you're an atheist, an agnostic, you can be a devil worshiper, right? And, and should you come to God and say, I want grace, unconditional. God welcomes you. God receives you. God welcomes you, and you're, God's like, you're in. Dude, you, you want to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ? You're in. There are no conditions. There's no past. There's no sin. There's no failure. There's no history in the, ba- in the past that can ever separate you from the love of God. It is totally unconditional for non-believers, okay? But when it comes to believers... Those who are brothers and sisters in the life of the faith, God draws a boundary on love. And that boundary is orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Say those words with me. They're fun words. Orthodoxy. Orthopraxy. Okay, so ortho means literally straight. Straight. So an orthopedic doctor, what does the orthopedic doctor do? Broken bones, he fixes it or he or she sets it straight, right? That's what an orthopedic doctor does. Orthodoxy means straight or right belief. Doxy has to do with knowledge, right knowledge. So when it comes to those within the church, those who have already said, yes, Jesus, I receive you as Lord and Savior, if you've come into the faith, then heresy, no way. Orthodoxy matters. If you come into the church where you were before, you were like, hey, Jesus is just like Buddha, and all religions get to heaven, and and Jesus is just like Allah. There's no difference. They're all the same. We're all worshiping the same God. Before you became a Christian, that's okay. Once you become a Christian, you know what you just did when you said, Jesus, I receive you as Lord and Savior? That confession means, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. Not through Buddha, not through Allah, no other way. That's what you just did when you came under faith. You became orthodox. And so, no, heresy, false teaching, Oh, no. There's no room for that in the life of the church because heresy will destroy the church. Orthopraxy. Praxy is where praxy literally, similar word is practice, but it really means where what you believe is consistent with how you live. Ortho, straight living. Straight, right living, right? Orthopraxy. So let's imagine, look, before you became a Christian, you're a total jerk. You were just a total jerk, just mean to everybody. And you, you were a total jerk, right? And for non-Christians, God's like, We love you even though you're a jerk. And we receive you even though you're a jerk. But because God loves us so much, God can't let you stay a jerk. Because you see, everywhere you go now, you represent Jesus. And people who don't know Jesus will get to know Jesus through you. And Jesus ain't no jerk. And so... No, if, in fact, look at the behaviors that Jesus identified. So if you're envious, if you're boastful, if you're proud, if you dishonor others, if you are self-seeking, if you are easily angered, if you delight in evil, and if you don't delight in truth, if you are these things, 
These behaviors are toxic. They will destroy the body. They will destroy community. And so it's anathema. They are not allowed. And so if you practice these types of toxic behaviors, hand the dude over to Satan. Because it's killing the church. And what's astonishing about... So, look. If you're a jerk and you practice these things and you're hurting someone else in the life of the church, it's not just the other person you're messing with. you got to be careful here. Remember when Paul, before he knew Christ, he was named Saul. Do you remember that? And when Saul was going around persecuting Christians, Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. And he's jailing Christians, he's persecuting Christians, he's beating up Christians, he's imprisoning Christians. And Jesus shows up to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting Christians? Is that what he said? He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because every time you attack a sister or brother, that's my body you're attacking. And so when you're messing with one of these beloved and you're toxic, that just won't do. I will protect my body from viruses. I will protect my body from cancer. I will protect my body from toxicity. Orthodox matters. Orthopraxy matters. Those are the boundaries. If you are a Christian, unconditional love and so here's what that means and here's why it's so hard I can really not like somebody and they can really not like me but I still have to extend unconditional love because we're not talking toxic behavior they're just annoying there's a difference I still need to practice patience, kindness, keeping no record of wrongs, rejoicing with the truth, protecting, trusting, hoping, always persevering. And that's hard. That's hard. But within the bounds, as long as they're not a heretic, as long as they're not toxic, Unconditional love. Those are the boundaries. So God loves us just the way we are. That's to all human beings, sinners and unbelievers, right? And then what's the second clause? God loves us so much he cannot leave us where we are. Orthodoxy, orthopraxy. Jesus is Lord, and there is no other authority. The Bible is the only authority we have as Christians. And God will not share his honor with anyone else, for he is a jealous God, and he will protect his honor. Right belief matters. God will not allow sinful behavior and toxic behavior to go unchecked in the church. God names Toxic behavior, because toxic behavior destroys the body, Christ's body. And so God will protect his body. Orthopraxy matters. And that's why Paul says, remember in chapter 5 earlier, he said, I wrote to you in the letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But no, I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is still sexually immortal immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler or is practicing toxic behavior. Don't even eat with such people. Do you see the two categories of people? Within the church, the boundaries are orthodoxy, 
orthopraxis, or orthopraxy to non-Christians, unconditional. There is no sin that can ever separate us from the love of God. That's the way it works. All right. Then, takeaways. I want you to reflect. We know Jesus is all these things. Love, right? Patient, kind. How many of those words describe us? Where are we lacking? What do we need to do to be those things? And I'm, I, I will work on this with you. Because that's the church he's calling us to be. Practice love. Unconditional love. Within the boundaries of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. And so I'm going to end with this quote. Uh, and it's attributed to John Wesley, but it's been attributed to St. Augustine and a bunch of other people. So I don't know who said it, but I know I didn't make it up. This is, but it's brilliant. I think the way this applies to us is in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Isn't that nice? In essentials, unity. And there aren't many essentials. Essentials are Jesus is Lord. That's non-negotiable. The Bible is our authority. That's non-negotiable. That Jesus died on the cross, descended into hell, rose again from the dead to pay and atone for my sins. That's Non-negotiable. That's an essential doctrine. What about things like abortion? Pro-choice or pro-life? Pro-choice or pro-life? Should Christians, can Christians be on both camps? Can you have Christians in both camps who love God, who love Jesus? They can disagree. That's not an essential. Capital punishment. That's not an essential doctrine. We can disagree. What about modes of baptism? Presbyterian sprinkle. Baptist dunk. Which is the right way? Did you know Christians used to go to war? We would go to war. The German Lutherans went to war with French Baptists. With swords killing each other because they didn't baptize right. That's wrong, dude. That's not an essential doctrine. You don't kill people over, you got sprinkled, I kill you. That's wrong. And then you know what the Lutherans and Calvin did with the Baptists? They said, you want to be dunked? They would tie stones around Baptists and sink them in the lake and in wells, and we drowned Baptists. You want to be baptized? I'll baptize you. That's stupid. When you take non-essentials and make them essentials, the church gets ugly. There aren't many essentials. Jesus is Lord. That's an essential. The Bible is our authority. That's an essential. But don't make items for which we could disagree and make them essentials. When you do that, church gets real ugly. When you think the Republican Party is God's party, when you think the Democratic Party is God's party, that's ugly. When you think pro-choice is God's way, pro-life is God's way, you can have your views, but they're not essential doctrines. Essentials are right here. That's all that is. Jesus is Lord. And then when it comes to secondary issues or non-essentials, practice liberty. Be gracious. And then in all things, practice charity. That would be a fantastic church. Let us pray. Hey, God, thank you so much for your truth. And forgive us for the ways that we keep making our preferences or our thoughts on the same level as Jesus is Lord. Forgive us for that. 
And forgive us for the times the church has behaved pretty ugly because we forget that. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your grace. Help us to be this church that practices unconditional love with unbelievers and that remembers the boundaries that protect the church. Orthodoxy, right belief. Orthopraxy, right practice, right living. So help us to be changed and become more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.